McKissick name is well known in Durham County and throughout North Carolina. We have Senator Floyd McKissick here in the chair for this edition of Common Ground. Durham County Senator Floyd McKissick Jr. joins us. Sir, yeah, thank you for being on. Excellent. It's a privilege and honor to be here. You're Absolutely. You're an active member of the Senate in the Democratic Caucus. Ten years on the job. Thank you for your service to North Carolina. Why, thank you. It's been a privilege and honor to be here, and I thoroughly enjoy serving uh, my constituents in my district, and more importantly, the entire state of North Carolina. Well, from 07 to 17, a lot's happened politically in this legislature. Absolutely. How's I mean, it different? Well, it's been profound changes. I mean, when I got here, Democrats were in the majority in both the House and in the Senate. I mean, Senator Mark Bass Knight and was preeminent in the way that he operated the, the state Senate. And Senator Tony Rand, I mean, it was uh, a Senate which was very progressive in terms of standing up for education for North Carolinians, progressive in trying to attract business to North Carolina, uh, progressive in turning to be inclusive of all the people in our state and uplifting all of the people of our state and, and taking us in a direction I think that we could all feel proud. And, and of course, when 2011 came, you saw the Republican majority come in, which had a vastly different philosophy, a different agenda. Uh, and in my mind, uh, they've set this state back profoundly in many respects. You know, that change in power came before the last redistricting. So you can't blame that on gerrymandering. A lot of Democrats sure. were flipped from office. That was in 2010. What happened that made the public say, after a century of Democratic rule, let's try the Republicans for a few terms? I think it was just the national political tsunami that occurred. And it occurred after the passage of the Affordable Care Act in Washington. And, uh, and people were somewhat discontent. I think they were not particularly happy with the president at that point in time. And so it tended to be somewhat of a protest vote. And really for the first time, that was a profound change in fundraising. The Republicans really went out and raised an awful lot of money. And it made a profound difference and a profound impact. And you began to see the dark money come into some of these races as a result of Citizens United being decided. Yeah, break this down for ordinary folks who are not in the political scene. You know, the sure. Republicans raised a lot of money and won, but you know, Bass Knight and Rand and uh, Speaker Black sure. and Speaker Hackney, they all raised lots of money when they sure. had the levers of power. How does that money flow, whether you like the way it flows or not? Sure. Well, when that money flows in, it can profoundly make a difference in the way of uh, the assets that you have available to run in these contested House and Senate districts. And in that particular year, uh, the Republicans were in a very strong, strong position. So I think with the national political tsunami being what it was, with the Tea Party movement coming into power, it, it had a profound and significant impact here in North Carolina. And of course the Republicans, once they got in that year, they were able to solidify that political base by basically redistricting the state, redistricting the legislative districts, redistricting the congressional districts in a way that gave them a profound political advantage, a partisan advantage, and a, a gerrymandering that's very, very difficult to overcome at this time. Has gerrymandering always been part of the equation, though, um, when it comes to redistricting? I've had former House sure. speakers kind of smile about the idea sure, that sure. we always want an independent redistricting uh, commission when we don't have the power. Well, I, I think if you were to look at, say, the congressional districts here in North Carolina, you, you basically got 13 members, and, uh, and what you used to have were seven Democratic congressmen serving from the state and six Republicans. It was relatively balanced, kind of reflecting uh, the composition of our state. Uh, of course, what you found after redistricting was that you were seeing three Democrats elected and 10 members of Congress that were Republican even though if you look at the election years, say 2012 for example, Democrats got more votes than Republicans, but ended up with fewer seats. Uh, and when it comes to legislative redistricting, there's such an exact science to it today. The database that's there that's present is so precise. It's not like it would have been back in 2000 or back in 1990. You can predict with uncanny accuracy with the data that's available, what voting habits will be. That's changed the political paradigm substantially. How much can um, big data mm -hmm. weigh in on policy and on things like redistricting? Because politics is as much a gut leadership decision. It's a lot of emotion in there. How do you mix it all? Well, I mean, I, I think one thing that tends to occur far too often today is that people will do a lot of polling. 
And, and rather than staking themselves out politically in terms of having political courage and being able to stand forth and help shape political opinion, even if the public may not be necessarily on board to start with, they tend to craft their policies and craft their positions based upon polls that give them some idea of where people are leaning. So they're responding to what they think will get them the vote. And if you've got money as the key lever in this process and you come up with 30-second spots, these 30-second spots intuitively respond to your emotions. They're not always particularly informative. And when you're doing 26 mailers, the mailers are just putting something in someone's mail spot that causes them to react. It's not always data-driven. It's not information and content. It really, in some respect, drives politics the lowest common denominator. But if you poll, we find out what people want or say they want from their leaders. Sure. Even if you don't agree with it, if your constituent says do it, do you feel obligated to do it or do you stand on your principles at the risk of your uh, political hide, so to speak? I think you have to use common sense and great judgment. You have to look at your district. You've got to look at the entire interest of the state of North Carolina. And you have to do a balancing of those competing interests. But I've never been afraid to go to people within my district, regardless if they were conservative, moderate, or progressive, and be straightforward. Share with them what I thought about issues. Share with them what I felt was good for North Carolina. It may not always be good for Durham, but it may be good for other portions of our state. And you make strong and persuasive arguments. But the most important parameter is listening, listening attentively, understanding the thoughts, what drives those constituents. And what you find is that you inform people, you talk with them, even though they might not have been on board to start with, they come on board. And when it comes to education in this state, I mean, I think most people are concerned about our public education system. They're concerned about whether our students are prepared uh, for the jobs of tomorrow. They're concerned about our public universities. They're concerned about whether we're able to compete, not just here in North Carolina, but within our country and within the world because today that talent pool is com you're competing with people all across the world. Yeah, that's a jobs. bipartisan expectation I would think. I don't know of anyone who's yeah. against us being competitive or against education. I guess differing philosophies of how we succeed as a state. I guess that's what's on the table. So how would a normal voter who has other things to do besides look at the North Carolina General Assembly, how do they figure out this is the direction we're heading in and I can receive responsible, informative data right. to make a, an informed judgment on an issue besides listening to the sound bites and the press releases. Well, I think it's about understanding that here in North Carolina, if you look at 50 out of the 50 states, our principals and our schools in terms of their pay, is, it's at the rock bottom. It's 50th. When you think about teacher salaries, we were very, very long time, 48th among the 50 states. Now we're up around 41 or 42. You look at the size of our classrooms. Mm -hmm. You look at technology in our classrooms. Uh, you know, kids need to have the tools that are necessary to help them to compete to, so that they understand the, uh, the learning curve and, and, and acquire the skill sets they use, whether you're talking about technology or computers or access to textbooks. Mm -hmm. but those types of things people really do understand. And they understand that if their kids don't have those assets, they won't be able to get the jobs of tomorrow. We heard that argument when Democrats were in charge. The schools never had the textbooks, the money. Uh, it wouldn't be computer tablets back 10 years ago, but certainly uh, certain supplies. Sure. What does it take? How do you, how does Republicans haven't been able to satisfy the public school systems yet? Democrats yeah. didn't, but had more sympathy from that crowd. What's the, what's the right recipe for? Well, I think 12. Democrats did an awful lot, too. I mean, we were up around the mid-range in teacher pay. I mean, we definitely were spending, even during the recession, up to $100 million mm -hmm. or so when it came to textbooks and, and technology in some instances. So, I mean, we, we were doing what needed to be done at that time frame. Could we do better? Absolutely. Can we move in a, in a better direction to assist the students in this state? Yes, we can. But I mean, even just getting to make sure that these kids, in terms of preschool education, have access, whether it's a more at four mm -hmm. type program, I mean, we can get there. Should there be bipartisan support? There is from time to time. But so often today, the discussion retreats to, rather than improving public schools, uh, grading them, creating stigma, 
so that uh, people don't necessarily want to send their kids there. And Why is it a and, stigma if, mm -hmm. if, if a parent can look at their school and based on all the other schools in the public schools across North Carolina, see an A through an F grade, uh, much like what we received in school for a grade for our effectiveness as sure. an operation? Well, I think what you got to do if you're using that system in which I've articulated mm -hmm. consistently, if we're grading schools and some of these schools are getting D's and S, then we have an obligation to adequately provide them with the tools and resources that they need, whether it's uh, teachers that have better training, whether mm -hmm. it's uh, academics in the classroom that need to be taught more effectively, and, and whether it's, uh, you know, access to technology, then we need to provide them with greater tools that they aren't there in that bottom quarter. But if we just grade them and we don't provide them with additional tools and resources, it's a disservice and it creates a stigma. And what we do is to give kids money to go to private schools instead. I'm not sure that's the answer. It can provide us with a further deterioration of our public school system. We don't want to undermine it. You know, it's been such an important tool. You've know, fallen this legislature for several years. Sure. You have been a loyal opponent, not a mean-spirited opponent, but right. a loyal opponent, much like Paul Stam was for years sure. in the Republican when Jim Black was running the House. And you speak up and you oppose Republicans on a lot of issues, I think most every one of them. So where can you work together in sincere bipartisanship? What issues do you see Republicans and Democrats going, yeah, we got that right? Well, I, I think there are issues that we can come together on, it's like just getting broadband out to some of the yeah. rural areas of this state, looking at some of the counties that are losing population, some of these rural areas that really need help and try to identify and target what resources are necessary to help uplift those counties, to help those places attract jobs and investment. Th that's an area where I think we can come together. We have to help those rural areas. They have to get the infrastructure. They need to have the access to technology that they need so that people there can not only have enjoy livelihoods, but they can attract jobs and employment. But we gotta do it at the same time not hurting our urban areas, our, our major growth centers that have led to so much prosperity in this state. So there are areas such as that that I think we can come together on. I mean, the potential is there, but um, it, it's yet to be determined. I, and I know I've worked with uh, certain members in, in trying to help us get there. Are the Republicans on board with you, you feel, based on the conversations you've had about getting broadband rolled out? It does seem there is a softening a bit on municipal broadband, maybe. Yeah, I, I think it's one of those areas where people understand that this day and time and era, you know, if you don't have broadband connectivity, no business is going to move there. If you don't have access to natural gas, you probably won't get people moving there. If you don't have adequate water and sewer, you, you have some real serious problems in terms of attracting growth, development, and jobs. And these rural areas are declining in population. You know, people don't think about natural gas lines. They think about it's gigabit I, internet, fiber optic I cable. Agree. I never hear much about natural gas. Uh, I know, but if you look at plants and businesses and industry, that is a factor but as my, well. But, Mr., but, but Senator, you're yes. a Democrat, and that is yes. a fossil fuel. And the people, uh, you have people who support Democrats who say, let's go more towards renewables and maybe not natural gas. And, and, and how I do am, you how do you weigh into all well, that? I believe in renewables. I'm a strong supporter of renewables. Supported Senate Bill Three that encourage us to have a. Uh, criteria in terms of renewable portfolio. I mean, but you do find people who don't want to go quite as far with renewables in terms of being uh, opposed to wind energy, particularly windmills that could be built in some of the eastern portions of this state. So jobs will come with natural gas, even if you are an environmentally conscious uh, yeah. senator or representative. You have to acknowledge natural gas has power. Is, is, yes. is wind and solar, is that there for job creation yet? Well, I think wind and solar is just a complement. I mean, you know, it, it diverses your energy generation portfolio. Mm -hmm. Is it an answer? Absolutely. It's not a panacea. It's just part of it. But it does provide some income for those who have those windmills built mm -hmm. upon their property. And that helps some of these rural outer line counties and communities. But, I mean, there's so many more issues that we need to be working on. Go ahead. Uh, Which one? You know, well, I mean, I think when you talk about education, we can come together on it. When you talk about well, one of the things we really need to deal with is health care in this state. And, you know, we've talked a lot about Medicaid expansion. Yeah, in but this that state. seems dead. Well, Donald it, Trump is your president, our president, and, and he uh, says no to that. Yeah, but, so but, but, I take but, the money if you're going to lose the money. Well, right now, I think the key reason in Washington that you have not seen any type of repeal yet is because all of these states 
that had Republican governors. I mean, there were 31 states out of um, the United States of America, and of course I think that includes the District of mm -hmm. Columbia. It also includes Indiana, where Vice President Pence was from, that expanded Medicaid in one version or another. And we got up to 500,000 people here that need health care coverage. We need to be deeply concerned about that because you say, why? It's not just about helping out that population, but the rural hospitals in the state uh, that have to provide indigent care in particular, uh, they are going to be closing. Which is free. That's exactly you right. Indigent any care is that. free. You're not getting reimbursed for it. And when those people come in, you can't turn them away. But the more and more they treat that population and they don't receive some compensation, Medicaid would pay them for providing services to that population. Those rural counties are be hurt. Not only that, we know it'll provide 20,000 jobs. And we're turning down $2 billion a year by not expanding Medicaid. I mean, it's something to be deeply, deeply concerned about. Health care for our residents in the state. So, I mean, it's a broad variety of issues. I mean, there's been uh, tax cuts that they have They never taken change. Place. It's roads, it's schools, it's good Absolutely. education for the kids. It seems like, we, you, I, I guess they've been debating this as long as there's been roads and kids and schools. It's uh, Well, and it's because they're basic public services. I mean, we're concerned about the quality of our environment. We're quite concerned about the education. I mean, think about it. Research Triangle Park, all the research institutions that were created. If you go back to Luther Hodges and Terry Sanford time frames and they were governor, it took root and hold and it led to the prosperity that this state enjoys today in so many respects. You know, I was thinking about you represent Durham County. It's got yes. one, it's got the hip, is it the hippest or the coolest city in America? That's Durham right. is that. We so that's urban be, center. That's exactly right. There are country folks in northern Durham County. Yes, there you are. You represent urban and urban suburban yeah, and, and rural, rural. and right. that puts you in an interesting place. It does. I how mean, do you balance those competing equities? I don't know how you do it. There's so much sympathy for the rural, sure. but urban power is coming, and those folks want to be heard, and here you are. Sure. Um, well, where do you lean? You an urban guy? Well, I, I, I listen rural? to all of my constituents because I balance the interests of each of those communities. I have over in Granville County towns like Oxford, Butler, mm -hmm. Creedford, Stovall, and Stem. I mean, you know, I work with those mayors. I work with those town councils. I try to make sure they have the assets that they need. I have not only Duke Medical Center mm -hmm. that's over in Durham, but I got Granville Health System, Systems over there in, uh, in Granville County, completely opposites in terms of their uh, needs, but many of them have parallels in t that you draw upon. And uh, those folks in Granville counties, they, they need the jobs uh, as, as much as anyone. And, and it, they don't just need to be a bedroom community. And Granville County is growing, it's thriving, it's prospering. You know, I mean, they're, they're doing some great things in Granville County, but you have to weigh those competing interests and you have to come up with ways that you can serve them both effectively. Are, are rural areas, are they best served by trying to convince them to adopt urban ideas in terms of ideas that might spark growth and, and innovation? the way you're used to seeing it in the Triangle Triad in Charlotte, or is there a secret, not a secret, but an economic strategy that works while still helping these rural counties remain sure. rural? Well, I think the nice thing about the rural counties is that they're typically more affordable. So housing is going to be cheaper there. The quality of life when you go outside, you're going to hear the crickets at night. Uh, but most importantly, they have unique attributes, and they can become uh, places where employers can come and locate that can benefit from those assets, from being close to Research Triangle Park in a close proximity, but not being able to afford to be in Research Park or in some of the other more expensive areas, but they're within a distance that they can travel and still be providers of services. And sometimes they're complementary services to the larger businesses and industries in the more intensely urban areas, and sometimes they are unique services. So they each have a place. You just gotta be able to identify what those particular market segments are and be able to draw upon them. But I've lived in both large urban areas and small communities all my life. At one point, lived up in Warren County. We were was, asking you about that. You, yeah. You're from Durham, which always been a, has always sure. been a city to me, and it's getting yes. bigger. And then uh, your father lived up at what was called Soul City. I guess it that may exactly still be right. called Soul City. Yes. And that's clearly farmland and yes. houses. So, sure. Um, where is the energy? I guess Durham's is, if Durham grows and is thriving as it's going, does it help those rural areas or does it 
direct all the attention back on to Durham as sure. a growing area. I, I think it helps the rural areas it tremendously. Does. Don't, you don't forget about Oxford because no, Durham is no. booming and needing lots oh, of Oh, absolutely not. I think if you look a decade out, you know, you're going to see places like Creedmoor. I mean, if you look at Raleigh, I mean, look to, to northern Raleigh, going right up to the Granville County line, up to, to where Creedmoor is. If you look at where Butner is, all of those areas are growing. When I lived up in Warren County, it was the 90th poorest county in the state of North Carolina. But I also was instrumental of my father in building that large regional water system that brought in water from Kerr Lake. And it's still the largest regional water system in this state. It provides water to Henderson, Oxford, over to Warren County and the city of Warrington. And now it goes over to Franklin County. It opened up that whole area to growth and development. You know, So I mean, infrastructure has always been critical. If you got the infrastructure, you got uh, highways like Interstate 85 and US 1, you have rail service as well. All of those are critical components in uh, making communities attractive to growth. And I think if you look a, a decade or two out, you're going to see places like uh, Granville County growing tremendously, Vance County growing, uh, as well as Warren County growing. That periphery will continue going out. Yeah. As a member of the Democratic minority status sure. in the Senate, how do you how do you do your best to stay relevant and at least make sure you're heard? I, you have great interaction with Senator Jerry Tillman. You barter yes. each other back and forth, almost Absolutely. like a hobby. But how do you get heard? How do you stay influential? How do you make the small wins that a majority party would give you sure. if they don't want to admit they're giving you a small victory? Well, the thing you have to understand and appreciate is that you network with people in the committee meetings, and more importantly, you network them in their office. So, you know, uh, I can go in and talk with many of the members in the majority. I can let them know how a bill will have some adverse impacts that they may not have foreseen, how it can have unintended consequences even for people in their districts, and, uh, and, and, and many times people will listen. You have to establish personal relationships. You can have fierce debates, but never personalize those debates. You talk about those principles and issues you disagree with, but you come together and you, you mitigate the, the impact, the adverse impacts that bills can have, but more importantly, you come together to pass good legislation as well. For example, Senator Raybon and I came together to pass a bill dealing with uh, uh, regulated transportation mm -hmm. networks like Uber, Lyft, and Sidecar. Senator Barefoot and I came together to deal with automatic license plate readers and and that technology and how the access to that technology can be utilized. But the list goes on and on and on, where you come together on those issues where you can partner, respectfully disagree on others, but more importantly, get amendments made on almost a daily basis right. to bills that are coming before us for consideration by having mutual respect and walking, you know, working across those party lines. But you know, depending on the crowd you're standing in, yes, you can walk by and somebody say, oh, there's McKissick. I've had someone come into our studio, and by virtue of just who they are, mm -hmm. somebody goes, oh boy. Is it as mean feeling in this building working across the aisle as the public thinks it is and as they are led to believe with certain hot button issues? Well, I think it depends upon the members. I think so that's some what, are that hot. Yes, I think some members absolutely that hot on both sides of the political aisle. Mm -hmm. But I think others of us uh, have a mutual respect and a rapport and can uh, work collectively on bills and, uh, and more importantly, uh, be able to engage in uh, fierce debate and, and then leave that room and be able to uh, talk uh, in a very open, honest, and candid way, uh, understanding that we may have differences, but we also can uh, come together. And for many of the members that are now in the majority, I knew them when they were in the minority. I knew where they sit, sat in that chamber I remember how they thought, and sometimes I'll remind them. You remember what you felt like? You remember what it was like? Is that what you want to impose upon someone else sometimes? And uh, it causes them to pause, to think, to reflect, but more importantly, to put it on a more human level. I remember when. And, uh, and, and uh, you know, when I was someone who had power within my chamber, I, I tried to make sure we looked out for people regardless of what agencies they were in. Didn't make a difference whether it was Republican that was heading up the Department of Labor or Department of Agriculture, if I was overseeing different parts of that budget, we make sure their needs got funded. They were not polarized. They were not marginalized because of their uh, party affiliation. That's the way we need to work. 
We need to do what's good for this state. With this last half minute of this interview, sure. I guess the 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 break of uh, recent break was a, a sort of a half time. We're three months into session. Very quickly, assess what you expect for the next three months heading through summer. Will you get a summer break? Well, I think that's yet to be determined. I think that uh, there will be great emphasis on trying to get us out of here by the end of July. I think it's unlikely we'll be out of here before then. Uh, you know, there, there's still a debate that's ongoing about uh, budget availability and the dollars that will be available. Uh, the governor had one number that he was dealing with. The Senate's dealing with a different number. House will be dealing with a different number. There's been emphasis made about uh, further tax cuts and further tax reductions. The Senate leadership has one approach. The House has another approach. Uh, there will be some very contentious issues that remain that come before us. And you got to be able to deal with them. And what's yet to be determined yet is what the court will do with legislative redistricting. And a whole different topic. So a I'm whole like, different topic. Very confusing. And we, yeah. Well, we, we're out of time, sir. I can go sure. on for hours. We didn't even talk to you about your dad. That's another whole other discussion. Sure. Your Absolutely. father. But Mr. McKissick, Floyd McKissick Jr., Senator from Durham County. Uh, look him up. He's on social media. One a big believer in that. Uh, thank you Absolutely. so much for being on the show. We'll have you thank on again you. really soon. Absolutely. Thank you very much. It's a privilege. North Carolina Channel is made possible by the financial contributions of viewers like you who support the UNC-TV network.